Howdy folks, I'm back with another YouTube video. And uh, now we're going to be talking about the gifts of healing. The gifts of healings. The gifts of healings. The gifts of of power are faith, workings of miracles, and gifts of healings. The gifts of power are faith, workings of miracles, and gifts of healings. These gifts operate in the realm of the physical. These gifts operate in the realm of the physical. They are the gifts of action which produce signs and wonders. Grant unto thy servants that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. Acts chapter 4, 29 and 30. God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, and with different miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. Hebrews chapter 2 Verse 4, Hebrews 2, 4. Now these gifts of power, these gifts of power constituted the works. These gifts of power constituted the works with which Jesus' ministry was accompanied and confirmed. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Acts 2.22 Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those works do ye stone me? John 10.32 The Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. John fourteen, ten through 12. Healings, most frequent of power gifts. Healings, most frequent of power gifts. The gifts of healings. Both nouns are in the plural in the original. The gifts of healings. Both nouns are in the plural in the original. Are the most frequently performed of the gifts of power. When Jesus could do no mighty work of power in his own town of Nazareth, he nevertheless was able to lay his hands upon a few sick folk and heal them. Mark 6, verse 5. As when Jesus was on earth, so also today. Many sick people apply for healing to those who believe. As when Jesus was on earth, so also today. Many sick people apply for healing to those who believe. As then... So today, God answers prayer, and the sick are healed. Thus it happens that the gifts of healing are the first of the gifts of power. Thus it happens that the gifts of healing are the first of the gifts of power that are exercised. It is Jesus' power to heal. It is Jesus' power to heal. The gifts of healings, since they are the gifts of the Holy Ghost, are divine enablements, divine enablements to heal the sick apart from the aid of natural means and human skill. He healed all that were sick, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying himself took our infirmities and bear our sicknesses, Matthew 8, 16 and 17.
how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Acts 10, 38. For this reason the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. 1 John 3, 8. This power of Christ to heal is transferred and conveyed to spirit-filled believers. This power of Christ to heal, this power of Christ to heal is transferred and conveyed to spirit-filled believers in and through the gifts of healings. Sickness is a result of the fall. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him, Acts 10, 38. And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, lo, these eighteen years be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? Luke 13, 16. This lordship of Satan... In the realm of sickness, this lordship of Satan in the realm of sickness can be traced back to the fall of man in the Garden of Eden. God said, For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Dying, thou shalt die. Genesis 2.17 Adam ate, and the death process began. Sickness is the precursor of death. Death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned, Romans 5.12. If death reigns over all men, then all men are subject to sickness. It's subsidiary. Sickness and death came into the world as a result of man's fall in the Garden of Eden and are thus directly involved and included in recovery from the fall healing is in the atonement thank god there is recovery from the fall and from its disastrous results behold the lamb of god which taketh away the sin of the world john 1 29 and he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only but also for the sins of the whole world first john 2 2 he has borne the penalty for our sins and carried the punishment in his body on the cross. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah 53, 5 and 6. Now, if he took our sins and bore our punishment, should we not expect that he would bear our sicknesses, which are part punishment for our sins? He did just that. In the verse above, quoted from Isaiah, it is stated, With his stripes we are healed. When Matthew quoted from the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, he said, Himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses, Matthew 8:17. Peter said, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, by whose stripes ye were healed. 1 Peter 2.24 James said, And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. James 5.15 David wrote, Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. Psalm 103.3 Jehovah said, I am the Lord that healeth thee, Exodus 15, 26. Healing is a part of our redemption, right? And that gives us boldness to claim it. Operations of the gifts of healing. Operations of the gifts of healings. And these signs shall follow them that believe. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Mark 16, 17. Mark chapter 16, verse 17 and 18. And these signs shall follow them that believe they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Is any sick among you? 
Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. James 5, 14 and 15. God has set in the church gifts of healings. 1 Corinthians 12, 28 laying hands on the sick by believers and anointing with oil by the elders are two ways. Laying hands on the sick by believers and anointing with oil by the elders are two ways through which the gifts of healings operate. God has set these gifts in the church. What God has set, let no man upset. Say that again. God has set these gifts in the church. What God has set, let no man upset. The gift of faith. Faith is the power by which God works. If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove. And nothing shall be impossible unto you. Matthew seventeen twenty. And though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, and have not love, I am nothing. First Corinthians thirteen two. Faith is the power with which God speaks, and by speaking brings things to pass. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God said, Let there be a firmament, and it was so and so on, for the six, six days of creation. Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, verse 6, verse 7, verse 9, verse 14, verse 20, and verse 24. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Hebrews 11.3, this is the power by which Jesus, God's Son, turned the water into wine, multiplied the loaves and fishes, stilled the tempest, cast out devils, and raised the dead. It is the word of divine authority. We may have God's faith. Jesus said, have the faith of God, Mark 11.22. Revised Version. When the gift of faith is operative, it is the faith of God which functions through men. When the gift of faith is operative, it is the faith of God which functions through men. When Peter and John performed the miracle of the healing of the lame man at the gate beautiful, Peter explained, The faith which is by him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Acts 3.16 When Elijah believed God for the mighty sign of the fire falling upon the water-soaked sacrifice, he prayed, Let it be known this day that I have done all these things at thy word. 1 Kings 18.36 His instructions were from God, and his faith also. When Moses decreed the death of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, and their 250 followers, by the earth's opening her mouth and swallowing them up alive, he said, Hereby ye shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of my own mind. Number 1628. God had given him instructions what to say and do, and also the faith with which to do it. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Galatians 2.20 The gift defined. The gift defined. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. John 15.7 Close contact with God. Receiving God's instructions and letting God exercise his faith through you constitute having the gift of faith. Elijah said to Ahab, 
as the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. 1 Kings 17, 1. This was the gift of faith, bringing things to pass by God's word. This verse also gives the secret of the gift, standing before God. Joshua said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. Joshua chapter 10 verse 12. Joshua was a man in whom was the Spirit of God. Numbers 27, 18. And Deuteronomy 34 verse 9. Elijah had this gift. Elijah told the widow at Zarephath, For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the curse of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. 1 Kings 17, verse 14. 1 Kings 17, 14. And it happened according to his word, to the captain of fifty whom Azariah sent to take him, Elijah said, If I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. And there came down fire from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. Second Kings chapter 1 verse 10. Elisha had his gift, this gift. Elisha had this gift. Elisha too had the gift of faith. He pronounced a curse upon the irrelevant children, which resulted in their death. 2 Kings chapter 2, 23 and 24. When the kings asked for his help, he said, Thus saith the Lord, Make this valley full of ditches. For thus saith the Lord, That valley shall be filled with water. And it came to pass that the Country was filled with water. Second Kings chapter three, sixteen to twenty. Later he smote the Syrian army with blindness. Second Kings six eighteen. Paul had this gift in the New Testament, in addition to the ministry of Jesus and Peter and John, as already cited, we find Paul smiting Elamus the sorcerer with blindness and casting the demons out of the girl at Philippi. Acts 13, verse 11, and Acts 16, verse 18. By the word of authority, he healed the lame man at Lystria. Acts 14, 10. And by this power, he brought Eutychus back to life. Acts 20, verse 12. Faith is the greater of the gifts of power. Faith is the greatest of the gifts of power and the greatest power in existence. Now we're going to be talking about the workings of miracles. The workings of miracles. Miracles by Jesus and by those that heard him. Stephen was a man full of faith. Grace. The revised version says, Charitos. Stephen was a man full of faith. Grace. Revised version, Charitos. And of power, Deutimus. Acts chapter 6, verse 8. This introduces us to the gift of workings of miracles. Both nouns in the plural, as distinct from the gift of faith. Stephen had both gifts. Although they are similar in nature, the Spirit distinguishes between them in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 9 and 10. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another the working of miracles. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles. Workings of power, due to miss. 
or do the mercy and wonders and signs which God did by him. Acts chapter 2, verse 22. Here is the gift of miracles in Christ's ministry. And the gospel was confirmed by them that heard him. God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 4. Miracles again by those that heard him. Paul spoke of himself as he that worketh miracles among you. Galatians 3, 5. Signs and wonders and mighty deeds were wrought among them. 2 Corinthians 12, 12. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Acts 19, 11, and 12. Here was a gift of healing and the power of faith operating through special miracles of power conveyed by handkerchiefs or aprons. Miracles and special miracles by Paul. Peter brought deliverance to the palsy. Ennis in his life to the uh, and uh, uh, Peter brought deliverance to the palsy. Aeneas and life to the beloved Dorcas, who had died. Acts chapter 9, 32 to 42. Peter also performed special miracles when his very shadow brought healing to those upon whom it fought, fell. Acts 5, 12 to 16. A miracle defined. A miracle is an orderly intervention orderly intervention in the regular operations of nature a supernatural suspension of a natural law when elisha made the iron to swim he reversed the law of nature which makes heavy objects sink second king 6 1 to 7 isaiah turned back the sundial of ahaz 10 degrees as a sign to Hezekiah. Isaiah 38, verse 7 and 8. Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh, and it became a serpent. Exodus 7, verse 10. He smote the waters that were in the river, and they were turned to blood. Verse 20. These were miracles. Instances of miracles. By his rod and his hand, Moses performed great miracles in Egypt and smote the Red Sea, and it opened a dry path for the children of Israel. Exodus 14, 16, and 21. He cast a tree into the bitter waters of Marah to make them sweet. Exodus 15, 23 to 25. He smote the rock to give water to the Israelites. Exodus 17, 6. And he held up his rod for victory over the Amicalites at Refuidim. Exodus 17, 8 to 13. He was invited to exercise the gift of faith in speaking to the rock of Meribah, Kadesh. Numbers chapter 20, verse 8. But rather he exercised the gift of miracles and smote the rock to bring water. The Lord chided him with, because he believed me not. Verse 12. Elisha took the mantle of Elijah and smote the waters of Jordan to go over on dry ground. He cast salt into the spring of waters at Jericho and healed the waters. Second Kings 2, 19-22. He cast meal in the pottage in which there was death, and there was no harm in the pot. 2 Kings 4, 38-41 Relation of miracles to the Holy Spirit baptism and to Christ. The word dunamis, 
the Greek word dunamis, which is translated miracles, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10, is the same word which is translated power. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you shall receive power, the Holy Ghost coming upon you. And in Luke 24, 49, until ye be endued with power from on high. Christ is the power, the dunamis of God. 1 Corinthians 1, 24. And he has promised to work with us, confirming the word with signs following Matthew 28, 20 and Mark 16, 20. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. John 14, 12. It is in, it is in fulfillment. It is in fulfillment of this promise. And in full realization of the promise of power in connection with the baptism of the Spirit, that the gift of of workings of miracles is given to the church. Sovereign miracles. There are certain miracles recorded in the Bible which were God's sovereign works, not the result of either the gift of faith or the gift of the working of miracles. When God first told Moses to cast his rod to the ground, it became a serpent, and Moses fled from it. At the command of God, he put forth his hand and took it by the tail, and it became a rod again. He thrust his hand into his bosom at God's command, and it became leprous. He put it in again, and it became as his other flesh. Exodus 4, 2 and 7. 2 to 7. God intervened for the protection of Daniel in the lion's den, it is not recorded or implied that Daniel spoke them into docility. God spoke from heaven and it was done. His presence with the three Hebrew children in the burning fiery furnace preserved them from destruction. The quality in Daniel and his companions, which stands out here, is their courage and other consecration. Our God is able to deliver us, but if not, Daniel 3, 17 and 18, God commanded the ravens to feed Elijah by the brook, Charioth, 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 4. God sent the earthquake to deliver Paul and Silas when they were in prison and opened the prison doors for Peter, Acts 16, 26. In Acts 12, verse 10, the Lord wrought the miracle of healing by a look at the uplifted servant. The Lord wrought the miracle of healing by a look at the uplifted serpent. Numbers 21, verse 8, again the Lord whisked Philip away to a distant city in a moment of time. Acts 8, 39 in Acts 8, 39 and, and, and 40. In other words, he was transported from one to place to another by the Holy Ghost. Ezekiel also was carried by the Spirit to a distant point. Ezekiel 8, verse 3. I've had that experience before while I was driving home. I was so tired, I fell asleep while I was driving, and I didn't crash, and I didn't get wreck. And one second, I was far from home, and the next moment, I was on the dirt road to my driveway. It was a complete miracle, because I had fallen asleep because I was so tired and overtaxed, shouldn't have been on the road, but God safely got me home. He took the wheel and drove my Chevy for me while I was fast asleep. It was God because... If God was not involved, I would have crashed. I would have wrecked. It was a working of the Spirit. So I, 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 so I, I know all about that transporting business. Happened once so far.
the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. Exodus chapter 16, verse 4. And he is ever able to set a table for us in the wilderness and do wonders on behalf of his children. His very name is wonderful. Isaiah 9, verse 6. Now we're going to talk about the gift of prophecy. The gift of prophecy. Gifts of utterance. Ye abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 7. We have considered the gifts of revelation and power. We have now to consider the gifts of utterance. These gifts include prophecy, tongues, and interpretation of tongues. They all have to do with speaking and so are grouped together and called the gifts of utterance. They operate in the realm of the spirit. The gifts of utterance can be said to express and convey the emotions of God. The gifts of revelation express God's mind. The gifts of power express God's power, while the gifts of utterance give expression to the feelings of God's heart. The words of God, Peter says, if any man speak gifts of utterance, let him speak as the oracles, word logos of God, 1 Peter 4, 11. Let him speak as a mystic oracle, speak the very words of God, serve as an expression of the very mind of God, as Christ, the word, is an expression of God. John chapter 1, verse 1. And verse 18, how high and holy is such an expression in ministry? The expression of the Spirit. Since prophecy was an expression of man's having received the Spirit's fullness in the Old Testament, and tongues is the evidence of the baptism in the Spirit after Pentecost, it is clear that utterance is a logical, spontaneous outflow an expression of the Spirit. These are the gifts which noticeably characterize the Pentecostal movement today. Prophecy, the greatest gift. The gift of prophecy is the only gift that we are told especially to covet. 1 Corinthians 14, 1 and verse 39. It therefore must be considered as outranking in value and importance all the other gifts. A possible reason for the procedure, the a possible reason for the procedure given this gift is that through its medium, the other best gifts find expression. Wisdom must be voiced or else it remains unused and latent. Prophecy is the voice through which wisdom speaks. Faith is the word of authority and must be spoken to be effective. Prophecy is the voice by which faith speaks, and prophecy has a function all its own as well. It is the voice of the Holy Spirit. The voice of the Holy Spirit. When the Comforter is come, he shall testify of me, John fifteen twenty six. The Holy Ghost testifies and speaks as he gives utterance to those who accept him in his fullness. Acts chapter 2, verse 4. He uses human channels, human voices that are yielded to him as great omnipotent, omniscient leader, as great omnipotent, omniscient leader of the church. He would naturally and properly desire and deserve opportunity to speak to his people. The gift of prophecy among spirit-filled people affords him that opportunity. Prophecy defined. To prophesy means to speak for another. Moses had demurred at God's calling him to speak to the Israelites and to Pharaoh. So God gave him Aaron to speak for him. See, I have made thee a god to Pharaoh, 
and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. Exodus chapter 7 verse 1. John the Baptist, the greatest of prophets, was a voice crying in the wilderness. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 3, Matthew 3 3, Matthew 11 9. Also, prophecy can be defined as speaking one's own language in the power of the Holy Spirit, or as divine ability to foretell as well as to foretell the elements of prophecy. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. He that prophesieth edifieth the church, for ye may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn, and all may be comforted. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 3, verse 4, verse 31. The Holy Spirit wants to edify, exhort, comfort, and calls to learn, and he uses a yielded prophet through whom to accomplish these ends. Edification. Jesus said, I will build my church. Matthew 16, verse 18. The Holy Spirit has been given the contract of building the church. To edify is to build. And the Holy Spirit uses the New Testament prophet as a voice through which to do his work of building the church. There are two ways in which to build the church. Add new material, new members, and to strengthen that which has already been added. Be, but if all prophesy, and there come in one that believeth not, or one unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all, and thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. 1 Corinthians 14, 24 and 25. Thus are converts added, and the church is built up, tearing down or stumbling or driving people away is the exact opposite. Tearing down or stumbling or driving people away is the exact opposite of the work of the Holy Spirit in prophecy, and that which produces this destructive result is not of the Holy Spirit. To build up the saints in the most holy faith, Jude 20, is to construct a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit, Ephesians 2, 21 to 22, to strengthen the saints, to increase their faith, and to develop their Christian character is the legitimate end an objective of the Holy Spirit as he speaks through one in the gift of prophecy. Exhortation. Exhortation is such a distinctive phase of the gift of prophecy that it is dignified by being called a gift itself. Romans chapter 12, verse 8. Here is the emotional appeal characteristic of the gifts of utterance, not just an emotional outburst by way of relief for pent-up feelings, but a controlled stream of earnest, vibrant Holy Spirit words directed to sinner or saint with a plea to turn from wrong to right, from error to truth, to obedience and faith. God loves and God pleads through the gift of prophecy. Comfort. Jesus gave us one of the major names of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, John 14, verse 16 and verse 26. Since this is his very name, it is no wonder that one of his gifts has, as its definite end, the comfort of the saints, that all may be comforted, 1 Corinthians 14, 31. The Lord loves his children and pours in his sympathy and his encouragement. He tells of his second coming, things to come, John 16, 13, that we may be comforted with these words. 
those words. First Thessalonians 4, 16-18. How sweet and encouraging the words of the Comforter, as they are given to an assembly through the lips of a godly speaker of prophecy. Prediction. While it is not stated in 1 Corinthians 14, it is not stated in 1 Corinthians 14 that the gift of prophecy includes the ability to predict future events. It must not be overlooked that this element is inherent in a prophet's ministry. Much of the infallible prophecy of Scripture is devoted to foretelling. This is the glory of the God of omnipotence that he knows and be times discloses the events of the future to and through his prophets. When he is come, he will show you things to come. John 16, 13. It is true that events then unrevealed and future have since been revealed to us by the infallible writers of the New Testament. And hence this function of the Spirit is no longer the most important. This explains why no reference is made to it in 1 Corinthians 14. Examples of prediction. But it must not be forgotten that there were prophets in the early church who predicted as well as gave messages for the present need. Agabus predicted that a dearth would come throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar, Acts 11, 27 and 28. The Holy Spirit witnessed in every city through which Paul passed on his way to Jerusalem that bonds and afflictions awaited him, Acts 20, verse 23. Was not this prediction and true prediction? Was not this prediction and true prediction? Agabus again predicted Paul's imprisonment at Jerusalem, Acts 21, 10 and 11. The element of prediction, once so dominant in the gift of prophecy, that it gave that predominant meaning to the word prophecy is still inherent in this gift, although not so necessary now to be exercised. Infallible prophecy of the scripture. There are degrees of inspiration in prophecy. Peter referred to prophecy of the scripture, 2 Peter 1.20. Jesus said, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Matthew 5.18, the scripture cannot be broken. John 10.35, the prophecy of the scriptures is infallible, and there is neither flaw nor imperfection therein, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. 1 Corinthians 2.13, Fallible prophecy of the churches. Fallible prophecy of the churches. But the operation of the gift of prophecy among the members of the Corinthian church. The operation of the gift of prophecy among the members of the Corinthian church and in churches today must be judged. Let the prophet speak two or three and let the others judge. 1 Corinthians 14, 29. The reason for this is that it is possible for some to prophesy out of their own hearts and out of their own spirits. Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel that prophesy out of their own hearts. Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. Therefore, behold, I am against you, saith the Lord God, Ezekiel 13, 2 to 8. How easy it is for one to allow one's own feelings or desires to enter into a message otherwise from God. Instances of fallible prophecy. When Paul was on his final journey to Jerusalem, the Holy Spirit witnessed in every city that bonds and afflictions were awaiting him. 
Acts 20, 23. At Tyre, certain disciples said to Paul, through the Spirit, that he should not go up to Jerusalem. Acts 21, 4. Agabus met them at Caesarea, took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle. Acts 21, 11. The disciples then tried to dissuade him from going, but he was determined to go. And when he would not be persuaded, it we ceased, saying, the will of the Lord be done. Verse 14. Now let us judge these prophecies. The Holy Spirit witnessing in every city that bonds and afflictions obeyed him was right. For subsequent events proved it. Agabus was right. But the disciples at Tyre were partly right and partly wrong. That Paul would suffer was right. But that he should not go was their own desire and judgment. Paul accepted what was right and rejected the human in their message. Fallible prophecy at Thessalonica. Eventually, there had been abuse of the gift of prophecy at Thessalonica. The prophets' messages were not appreciated, and so the prophets had begun to quench the spirit. Therefore, the apostle Paul wrote, Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesyings, but he did not say, accept all prophesying as the infallible word of God, but rather prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. 1 Thessalonians 5, 19-21 We should judge messages. It is a false reverence, which accepts everything which purports to be a divine message, as if it were from God directly and without possible human admixture. The simple believeth every word, but the prudent man looketh well to his going. Proverbs 14, 15. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits. 1 John 4, 1. To the Corinthians and to all, Paul says, Brethren, be not children in understanding. However, in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. 1 Corinthians 14, 20. This also applies to tongues and their interpretation, which together are equivalent to prophecy. Let us not allow or let us not allow our acceptance of tongues and prophecy in our churches. Let us not allow our acceptance of tongues and prophecy in our churches, forbidding not to speak with tongues run to the extreme of magnifying these gifts beyond their scriptural value or position. Rule for judging messages. The way to judge or prove the manifestations of the gifts which appear in our churches is to estimate whether or not they are exhortation in nature and result in edification and comfort to the believers. The reception which is accorded the operation of the gift, the reception which is accorded the operation of the gift is the revelation and proof of its purity. There is also the clear instructions. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most by three, and that by course in turn, and let one interpret. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Let the prophet speak two or three, and let the other judge. 1 Corinthians 14, 27-29. Disobedience to this regulation should be... Disobedience to this regulation should be disapproved and judged to be wrong. For these are the commandments of the Lord, verse 37. Gifts subject to personal control. This leads logically to the scripture, and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. 1 Corinthians 14, 32. Prophets can control their own prophetic spirit. From the Moffat translation of the Bible. This information is good 
for profits to have, lest they think they are compelled or ob obligated to yield to all spirit impulses that come to them. It is not quenching the spirit to be guided by your knowledge of scriptural regulation, by our respect for senior offices in the church, and by our love for others in exercising our gift. Prophecy not for guidance. There is no case on scriptural record where prophecy or tongues was used as a means of guidance or discovery of the will of God. At the time of the greatest crisis in the early church, when the apostles, elders, and brethren came together to consider the matter of circumcision being essential to salvation, no message in prophecy or tongues and interpretation was given to decide the matter. As already seen, when Paul was en route to Jerusalem, he rejected the effort of well-meaning friends who tried to prophesy as a means of guidance. Acts 21 verse 4 and verse 14. It was a vision in the night that Paul took as God's invitation for him to go into Macedonia, rather than a message by the prophet Silas, who was his companion, Acts 16, 9 and 10. The word of wisdom is the gift which we can expect to function when personal or church guidance is needed, rather than the gift of prophecy or tongues and interpretation. Then we have tongues and interpretation of tongues. Tongues and interpretation of tongues. God created gift of tongues. It has been stated that tongues plus interpretation equal prophecy. This is based on 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse 5 and is true. Why then is there such a thing as the gift of tongues when Prophecy in the plan of God gives directly in one's own language the message of the Spirit. Well, the first answer is that which God has done is always well done, and it is not becoming of us to criticize God. Isaiah prophesied by the Spirit, for with stammering lips and another tongue will God speak to this people. Isaiah 28, verse 11 and 12. Jesus himself said, And these signs shall follow them that believe. They shall speak with new tongues. Mark 16, 17. Thus tongues are God's idea and operation, and they who criticize him and his plan do so at their own peril. This gift indicates love for all nations. We can also see some of the reasons why God has given the gift of tongues and the gift of interpretation in addition to the gift of prophecy to which they are equivalent. As has been pointed out in the chapter on the evidence of the baptism in the Spirit, before the day of Pentecost when salvation was of one nation, the Jews, the mother tongue was sufficient as a vehicle for the Spirit's message. But on the day of Pentecost, salvation became available to all people and nations. So other and many tongues are now chosen by the Spirit as the vehicle through which to speak. The change of language through which he speaks at the time of his incoming is significant and indicative of the fact that now he wants his message to go to all nations, to the ends of the earth. Matthew 28, 19 and Acts 1, 8. Pentecost versus Babel. Going back still farther into Old Testament history for our antidote. Uh, what do we find is the relation between the speaking with tongues on the day of Pentecost and the confusion of tongues at the Tower of Babel? For one thing, we see that God long ago displayed his power to give men, even rebellious men, another tongue and language, and to give it to them as a permanent gift. Why should it be thought a thing incredible that the Lord could give to his own disciples the ability to speak his praise in an unknown or unlearned tongue as the Spirit gives utterance? In addition to that, the tongues at Pentecost 
were an indication and a hint that it was God's purpose ultimately to undo the confusion and separation which came at the Tower of Babel and bring together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad, John eleven fifty two, Tongues for a sign. In the law it is written, With men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, and yet for all that will they not hear me or believe me, saith the Lord. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign to them that believe not. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 21 and 22. On the day of Pentecost, devout men out of every nation under heaven came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born? We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful words of God, works of God, Acts 2, 5 through 11. They had not yet heard Peter's preaching to them. He preached to them later in their own language, but they had overheard, heard, overheard the disciples as they were filled with the Spirit and spoke with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. On this occasion, tongues were a most convincing sign to unbelievers. There have been many other occasions since when this has happened, for tongues are set for a sign. Then we have tongues for prayer. It is stated in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 that the chief use or the primary use of tongues is in prayer. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto man, but unto God. For no man understandeth him. However, in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. Verse 2. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. Verse 14 and 15. The saints who love their Lord the most and who thrill to the delights of prayer will enter into the sentiments of Charles Wesley who sighed, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. The gift of tongues is the answer to their prayer and deep heart desire. The Spirit has provided the tongues of men and of angels with which to pour out our hearts to God. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Romans 8.26 Tongues are a God-ordained outlet through which the Spirit of supplications will let his petitions ascend to the heavenly throne. They are needed they are needed in the plan of God. Tongues for messages. Another purpose and use of the gift of tongues is as a vehicle of expression for messages to the church. Tongues without interpretation in the church, Paul explains at great length, are meaningless and thus out of order. 1 Corinthians 14, 5-13 and 16 to 20, and 23, 27, 28, 17 verses. The speaker in tongues should pray that he himself might interpret, and in all cases should keep silent if there is no interpreter present. Although there should be an interpreter present. Come on, people, get with the program. Also, there should not be more than three messages in tongues during a service. But these regulations were not intended to be strangulations. These regulations were not intended to be strangulations because you don't want to strangle and quench the spirit. If tongues with interpretation equals prophecy, and if Peter called the tongues on the day of Pentecost the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy, 
I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and they shall prophesy. Then we can consider that tongues with interpretation should have the same effect and result in a church meeting that prophecy has, namely edification, exhortation, and comfort. When ye be come together, every one of you has a psalm, has a doctrine, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying, verse 26. This is when the whole church has come together in one place, verse 23. Tongues is one of the manifestations of the Spirit, which are given to profit with all, 1 Corinthians 12, 7. Wherefore, brethren, forbid not to speak with tongues, verse 39. Interpretation of tongues defined. The interpretation of tongues has been referred to many times in the treatment of the gift of tongues. A few additional comments, therefore, concerning this gift may suffice. Interpretation of tongues has nothing to do with the interpretation of scripture. Interpretation of tongues has nothing to do with the interpretation of scripture. That is the work of the teacher. Interpretation of tongues is a supernatural gift. Like the gift of tongues or the gift of miracles, it is entirely dependent upon the gift of tongues and has no function apart from that gift. It is in reality an interpreting or giving the sense of that which has been spoken in the gift of tongues. The nature of this gift the interpreter of tongues, who also speaks as the Spirit gives utterance, need not give, need not give the interpreter of tongues, who also speaks as the Spirit gives utterance, need not give a word for word exact translation of the message in tongues. So the interpreter of tongues, who also speaks as the Spirit gives utterance, they do not need to give a word-for-word -word exact translation of the message in tongues. The word translated interpret used here means to explain thoroughly, to explain thoroughly, to give the sense and the significance. The expounded, the same word translated interpret in 1 Corinthians 12 and 14. Unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Luke 24, 27. This more accurately expresses to us the idea of explaining thoroughly and carefully the full meaning. This then is the nature of the gift of interpretation. The message in tongues may be short and a much longer interpretation ensure. The message in tongues may be short, and a much longer interpretation ensue, and vice versa. So the message in tongues may be short, and a much longer interpretation ensue, and vice versa. The message in tongues may be short, and a much longer interpretation ensue, or the message in tongues may be longer, and the interpretation may be shorter. But the point is, the message in tongues may be short, and a much longer interpretation ensue, and vice versa. The message in tongues may be longer, and the interpretation may be short. When Daniel inter interpreted, when Daniel interpreted the three words which Belshazzar saw written on the wall, he used three sentences in which to give the interpretation. Daniel 5, 25 to 28, he explained the meaning of the words to the king. Its importance. Let him who has the gift of interpretation consider the importance of his gift. The speaker in tongues is dependent upon the interpreter. For the completion of his message. If the latter fails, the message in tongues has been given in vain. 
So everyone needs to get with the program. The time of the assembly wasted. So if the ladder fails, the interpretation fails, the message in tongues has been given in vain. The time of the assembly wasted and the scriptures disobeyed. So everyone needs to get with God's program and get with the program in a hurry. The responsibility for this failure rests upon the interpreter if he has quenched the spirit. Quench not the spirit. And if you do, there will be hell to pay. Also, the quality of the message in tongues. The quality of the message in tongues will be judged by the interpretation. For the interpretation is all that is understandable to the hearers. The message must be to edification, exhortation, or to comfort. And spirit-filled Christians present, and spirit-filled Christians present, will be able to sense whether or not the message has served to this end by the spiritual quality and scriptural correctness of the interpretation. Both the message and its interpretation will be judged. We thank you, Father God, for your word. For every eternal established in heavens comes down among and dwells among men in the earth. Open up our eyes to see all that you would have us to see and our ears to hear all that you would have us to hear. And let the Holy Spirit baptism return to all the churches as many as will receive your word and let them become spirit filled again and let the gifts and the fruits of the spirit once again be supreme in the hearts and the minds and the lives of all the believers privately and publicly individually and corporately in jesus name in jesus name for the people to start profiting off the gifts of the spirit again in jesus name